you turn your Bibles now to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, um, we are just making our way through this book, one of Paul's earliest letters in the New Testament. Um, if you were here a couple weeks ago, you'll remember that Thessalonica is a city in the northern part of Greece, kind of between where Turkey is now and the main part of Greece. They're a port city on the northern part of the um, Aegean. Uh, and he begins this letter with a very long thanksgiving for the Thessalonian believers, about three chapters long. Uh, today we're going to read the very first chapter, all of it, but we're really going to just focus on three verses, around a ver or four verses, verses three, three through six. So let's hear now Paul's letter to the first Thessalonians and chapter one. Paul. Silvanus and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, and God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh God, we pray that uh, even as we look at words and ideas, that they would come alive to us by your work, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that this would be your time, O oh Lord, that we would simply yield ourselves to your love and to your will. We ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus who loves us. Amen. Uh, growing up in the 1970s, there was one time of the week which was better, the most valued and wonderful time of the week, better than any other day of the week. And any of you who grew up in the 70s or maybe the 80s, uh, you might know exactly when that was. And of course, that was Saturday morning. Why? Well, because Saturday morning was when all the cartoons came on. We grew up with, I know this is going to be shocking to you, but only about five channels, right? That was it. ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS, and maybe one independent channel, maybe two if you lived in a big city. That was it. And they didn't show cartoons all the time. We didn't know anything about Nickelodeon or anything like that. You just had cartoons on Saturday morning. So you'd get up, you'd stay in your pajamas, maybe you were at a sleepover with a friend's house, and then you'd flip on Hanna-Barbera or whatever, Scooby-Doo, whatever you wanted to watch. But the best part, of course, were not the, ha ha the 22 minute cartoons or the half hour shows, but what came in between them, uh, those formative three minutes of schoolhouse rock. That's where we all learned our U.S. government and U.S. history 
And you can go back and look at them, and they're kind of dated. I, I don't actually recommend melting pot anymore to you. It's kind of racist, to be honest with you. Go, go back and look at it, and you'll see exactly what I mean. They kind of forget, like, Native Americans and African Americans. It's just all Italians and Brit. Never mind. But anyway, that's what you, I grew up with. You go back, and you look, and you say, oh, my goodness. No wonder I was influenced by all this stuff. But what, if you grew up, and is it still a thing? Like, you younger folks, do you, do you know what Schoolhouse Rock is, or am I terribly dating myself? Like, we, we brought our kids up on it, but, but on DVDs and so forth. All right, so if you watched Schoolhouse Rock, what was your favorite song? And don't, you can't say Melting Pot now, I'm sorry. That's, I've, I've ruined that one for you. Conjunction Junction, that's a solid one. What do I hear over here? It, I'm just a bill, yes. I mean, that's how I learned all of my U.S. government. All right, someone just said the best one. The very first song, by my judgment, is the best one by a guy named uh, Bob Doro from 1973, and that is Three is a Magic Number. It's just a sweet, sweet song. Three is a magic number. Yes, it is. It's a magic number. Somewhere in that ancient mystic trinity, so there's a little theology in here, right? You get three as a magic number, the past and the present and the future, faith and hope and charity, which is in our text. The heart and the brain and the body give you three as a magic number. Now, I actually think Paul agreed with that because he often uses three as an organizing principle in his text. So it's not just Presbyterian pastors who invented that. Paul did it, and maybe nowhere else in his letters is that more evident than in our text. We're going to see three sets of three. I don't know if you noticed that. So if you're taking notes, that's the way we're organizing it, three sets of three. But what's more important is not just seeing the organization, but what it points to, what Paul's getting at, the magic that they contain, if you will. Now, last time... We considered how corporate this letter is, that it's from a team. Actually, it's three guys, but I don't think that's part of it. It's from, it's from a team of writers to a community of believers made up of both Jews and Gentiles. And so it's, we saw how the gospel brings different sorts of people together, which is often hard sometimes. People from different backgrounds, different convictions, different races, uh, and so that's why Paul then begins with thanksgiving for them all. Uh, before he begins to tell them about the various errors that had crept into the church, he says, I give thanks for all of you. Whatever your theology, whatever your defects, whatever your background, Jew and Gentile, he gives thanks for all of them. And what a great model that is for us as we think of one another, and we especially think of those people that have given us a hard time and that we, we struggle with. Can we give thanks for them? And so let's look through our text and see what it is Paul gives thanks for. And we do so to look, see if we see it in ourselves and if we can see it in others. So let's begin in verse 4, where Paul says, For we know brothers and sisters loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but in power and the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Now, what we have to do is understand the flow of Paul's thinking. Verse 4 is actually not its own sentence. It's a continuation of verse 3. Uh, really, the original is saying, knowing brothers. And so what is, what is he knowing? Well, look back to verse 3. He remembers, first of all, before God and Father, three things about the Thessalonians. We looked at this last time. Basically, faith, love, and hope. Do you see that? This th these th show up in Paul all the time. Faith, hope, and love. That's where it all starts. And when, we have, when others think of us, when they think of you, what do you want them to see? What do we want them to see? Not accomplishments or giftedness, not looks, not wealth. What we want them to see most is our faith in God, our hope in Christ's return that keeps us going, and our sincere love for others. But, but where, do, where do these come from? Right? Let's, let's think about this, because this is where it matters. Do you struggle with any of those when, when, when things get hard? 
Think about your, your last trial in your life that you're, that you're really wrestling with. Is it causing you anxiety? Well, I'm, I'm sure the Thessalonians had this as well because down in verse 6, he says, you received the word in much affliction. We read in Acts how they're getting persecuted right away. And so what do you struggle with when, when life gets hard? Instead of faith, do you ever feel, feel fear instead that things aren't going to work out? and you're paralyzed. Instead of hope, can you see only darkness ahead and a, and a grim future? And instead of love towards others, do you feel instead an anger and a resentment? Well, how do you, well, how do you get out of this cycle? How do, you, how do you get out of it? Well, that's, well, let me just, if you're in a dark time, let me just, there's like some, a couple of practical solutions. First of all, just, just very simply, Read the Psalms. Now, we want, we, everyone ought to be reading. If you can read, because uh, you watch Schoolhouse Rock and learn Conjunction Junction, you know how to read. We want you to be reading the Word daily. And Pastor Rolo sends out a guide, and there are other excellent guides on our website, and you can find to be in the Word daily. But if you're just, any of you struggle, like, actually reading the Word because you're just too depressed, and you, you look at that plan where you're supposed to read four chapters a day, and you say, I just can't do it. No one wants to raise their hand, but I... We've all been there, I think, or many of us. Well, look, here's what you can do. Just open your Bible halfway through, and you'll end up in the Psalms. And if that's all you can do, read a Psalm and see what the Lord has for you there. They're full of anxiety and full of hope and faith. Read the Psalms. And if you're on your smartphone, open it up halfway there. I don't know. That's one thing. Another thing is to, to do what you're doing right now. Stay in fellowship. Stay with fellow believers. You're, you're not supposed to walk through darkness alone. Be with one another. Be vulnerable. Be with people that are safe and will understand and pray for you and support you. But there's a third thing we can do, and that's to remember good gospel doctrine. To remember the truths of Christ, and that's what Paul does here in our text. So he reminds them, not only that they had faith, hope, and love, but where those came from. This is so important. Did you notice that three things? Verse 4, we know that you're knowing, brothers, you're, you're loved by God. There's one. He has chosen you. That's two. And because our gospel came to you. So notice this. Faith, hope, and love, those are internal things, right? We, we, we have those inside by the Holy Spirit but they come from things outside of us, things that don't have to do with our feelings or with the strength of our faith. The love of God is objectively true. Our election in Christ is always true. And the gospel is the proclamation of what God has done in history, that Jesus lived, that Jesus died, that Jesus rose again, and that Jesus will come again. These things are, come from outside of us. Now look, it's, it's good to do internal searching, to, to see what's going on. As the psalmist wrote, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be in any wicked way in me, any wicked way, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's where revival always begins. It begins by seeing our need. We, God is always there. He's always true. But, but then when we see our, the, our gap, that we have left him, that we've neglected him, that we're selfish, that we're not repenting, that we're asleep spiritually, that's where revival starts. But it never ends there. It never ends with where, how we are doing. Instead, it turns to what God has done for us in Christ, these things that are outside of us. So let's look at how each of these help us. When, when you're going through a hard time and your faith uh, ebbs low, when, you, when you're not sure, you would, well, then, then you have to remember you're loved by God. You are precious in his sight. He looks at you and you're the apple of his eye. Now, the world may not see it. The, the world may just run you down as a nobody or a loser or a failure or somebody who's ill and, and useless. But God loves you. And that is an objective fact we are to cling to. So believe it. And so here's the thing. When you're not feeling it, and yet you still believe it, that's faith. 
That's telling God that his promises are true. Let, let God be true and every man a liar, including my own feelings. That's faith. That's giving the glory to God, saying, you love me and you love this world. And that's what I'm going to cling to no matter what. That's what Job did with all his whining and complaining. And my goodness, if we went through what he did, we'd whine and complain too. But he still clung stubbornly that God loved him and that one day he would see his Redeemer in the flesh, eye to eye. That's the first thing. God's love comes from outside. The second is what happens when our hope fades. When life seems overwhelming and your future seems grim and all you want to do is just, just well, pass on into glory. And now, it's true, troubles are certain in the Christian life. And in fact, your life will be objectively harder for following Christ. It's a, it's a promise. It's a blessing to die to yourself and to be a servant and, 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 and to allow troubles to come to you, to humble you. But when it gets too hard... And when things seem too grim, you can remember what Paul says next, that God has chosen us in Christ. Nothing can take that away from you. Your salvation is not dependent on the strength of your faith or in how good your church is or how well things are going in your life. Your salvation is dependent on God placing his love upon you from all eternity before you even breathed your first breath. Now, many of you know that we call this the doctrine of predestination. And that's not something that John Calvin made up. And different churches understand it in different ways, but they all have the doctrine of it in, in some degree. That before any of these Thessalonians were even born, God predestined that Paul and his friends would travel there and share the gospel with them. And more than that, we believe that God predestined that, they would, the, that the believers would each believe individually. Now, it's true, they, they all had to believe. They all heard the gospel that, that, that God himself came to earth, that he shed his blood for them, that in him is eternal life. And so they, they all had to believe it they had to choose Jesus as we must each choose Jesus. But they chose because God first chose them. As John puts it, they loved because God first loved them. You, you see how that works? So first, they're there, they're selfish, they're in their sin, they hear the gospel, and then God changes their hearts. He regenerates them, and then they choose Christ. This is a wonderful truth. We're going to sing about this later, how God is the one who comes in and changes us so that we then freely follow after Christ. But it's all of God. You see this? This is why this is important, that, that God's got you in his hands and nothing's going to take that away from you. He's the one who chose you in Christ. This is what grace is all about, that salvation is entirely from God and it's through God and it's to God. And so we learn to depend on them. Now, ironically, there are people that don't even officially believe in this doctrine, that, that, that live it out better than some of us. They understand that God loves them. Listen to the way Paul puts it in Romans 8, if you're, if you're struggling with this. Paul says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You see that? We love that God, all things are working. He loves you and all things, even though we can't see them, are working for our good. For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. That means he forgave their sins. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That means they'll live forever with their new resurrected bodies. So all those God has predestined, he will bring to heaven with him. Now, Paul then, what's the takeaway? What's, what, how does this encourage us? Paul goes on in Romans 8. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Christ? 
For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the gospel. That's how good this is. That's why Paul wants the Thessalonians to know where their hope comes from. It's because God has chosen them, and they'll never lose that. That's what keeps them going. That's what keeps us going. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. And until then, we hang on. Finally, when you, we look at the third one, what, what do you do when you're your love for others wanes when, you're, when you, you don't want to labor in love for other people. You just want to withdraw and live for yourself, as, as the world teaches us. Live for the weekend, live for retirement, all that stuff. And that's what, that's what you want to do. Now, look, sometimes you, you need that. You need rest. You need self-care. You need fun. You need hobbies. You need sports, whatever it is. You need that to keep going. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the creation God has given us is good and lovely. Don't become hyper-spiritual where you're, you're not allowing your body and mind to have fun. Paul rebukes that in Colossians 2 and 1 Timothy 4. So yeah, there are times where you need to take care of yourself and rest, but, but part of it is, is so that you can keep going, so that you can recharge, uh, to remember to live for others. But you, you know what I mean. It's when you, when you see others in need and you just don't care. You hear about the earthquake victims in Syria and Turkey, and you're like, that's that country. Let's worry about our borders and our country. And you don't even pray for them or think about sending money. You think about someone that's, that's just constantly a drain, and you, maybe you're not the one who needs to care for them, but you just don't care. So what do you do when, when your love grows dim? Well, again, it comes from outside of us. We need Christ to come in. We need to decrease in Christ from outside, come in and give us more love. As Paul says in Ephesians, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. You see that? He goes on, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. That's the, that, so the gospel came to the Thessalonians, this good news of God's love for them in Christ, and then that is what changed them. And so when you're, when your love is, when you're struggling with your love for others, you, you got to come back to the gospel. Remember how much Jesus loved you, and if he's loved you this much, how can you then not love others? So Paul then begins by giving thanks for their faith, hope, and love. That's the first set of three. Then he says where those three came from, God's love, God's calling, and God's kindness in the gospel. That's the second set of three, these objective truths that we cling to. But then moving on, and this is where, then Paul then describes how those objective truths worked in their lives. And this is important because it's the same way it works today. If revival starts with introspection, and then it moves on to what God has done for us in Christ, how do we keep learning the gospel? Well, let's look at what Paul says. And again, this is now the third set of three. Once again, as Paul's watched the Schoolhouse Rock video. Here's this third set of three. He says, our gospel came to you, verse 5, not only in words, so that's the negative, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Those three things. So let's talk about the negative first. Not by word only. So it does come by the word. Paul came and he knew his Old Testament scriptures. The Jews in Thessalonica had the Old Testament scriptures. He showed them how they pointed to Jesus Christ. But then he also told them the good news, which was the word of God. And then we have now written down in the New Testament 
as Paul says in Romans, faith does come by hearing. It's coming by what you're doing now. It's not a show. It's not a drama. It's not uh, even artwork as beautiful as I love art. I love especially 20th century. It's wonderful, most of it. But that's not how the gospel it comes from hearing the promises of God and reading them in his word. Faith comes by hearing, but it's not by words only. It's not just logic. It's not just abstract ideas and truths debated by ap- academics in the ivory tower. And let me just tell you something. If you grew up Presbyterian, if you grew up in the Reformed faith or you're new, let me tell you a problem we have is we love doctrine and truth so much that we attract truth lovers and truth debaters. And very often they're operating in the word only, but without its power. They're not, they're not letting the gospel uh, transform who they are in their hearts. They just want to figure out what's true and then imply and, and impose it on others. Now, Paul says that for the word, these words to be effective, it must come with three things. First, it comes by power. Now, now what does that mean? It, it does not mean loud preachers who prance around and are good with their arms. It could mean that. But that's, that's, he, it's not an emotional thing. Look, one of, the, one of the most effective preachers in the PCA, the one who's been used of God to, to do so much good, is a man named Tim Keller, right? A lot of you have heard of him. But his preaching is pretty quiet. It's kind of dry and academic in some ways. Now, but there's a quiet conviction to him. He's, him, he's being himself, but there's a power to it because he believes it. And it's not about him, it's, it's about Jesus. I mean, the most animated he gets is when he kind of says, now, now listen, and he starts talking a little, uh, a little faster. He's a very effective preacher. But it's not power as the world thinks of it. It's not loudness. But Christ is in it. So the word came with power to the Thessalonians. There's a a spiritual power, as we read about in Isaiah. This is why we do want everyone to be in the Word daily and in home groups that are opening the Bible literally. And even if you're studying another book, read, read a verse or something. So that's the, the Word comes in powerfully into your life, even in a quiet way. We believe as the Holy Spirit empowers it. That's what changes us and changes the world. Second, Paul says, it doesn't just come with power but it comes in the Holy Spirit. So we have to be careful here. This is not, in the grammar, it's very clear this is a second thing listed. It's It's a list. It's not the power of the Holy Spirit. He talks about that elsewhere. This is comes with power, with effectiveness, and in the Holy Spirit. Now, why, why is he listed as a second thing? I'm not entirely sure, but I, I think here's the difference. Do, do, do any of you play sports or have played sports and team sports and you have a coach and, and your coach tells you, hey, I want you to go out there and play with heart. Like you've got the skills, but you, I need you to play with heart. Any of you been told that or you've seen a sports movie and that's in every sports movie at least once, right? The halftime speech, the famous half. But here's the thing. What good does it do you to play with heart if you're not even breathing, if you're not even alive? That, the, uh, the coach's speech to play with heart wouldn't do any good if the locker room is full of skeletons. So here's the difference. The word comes with power, but the Holy Spirit gives life. He is the one that, 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 that's doing God's work. He is the one who gives us breath, literally, the scriptures teach us, but also spiritual breath, spiritual life. You must be born again by water and the Spirit, Jesus tells Nicodemus. And the Holy Spirit is God. He's a person. He's not a power. He's not a force that we tap into like Star Wars and those stupid little things in the blood or whatever that is. It's He's not, it's not, look, we tap into, no, he, he, he's a person. He's God. He does what he wants, believe it or not. You can't control the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus says he's, he's the wind. You can't put him in a bottle. You can't just 
get all the words right and the perfect dramatization and the sermon right. The Holy Spirit's going to do what he wants. And he takes some great sermons and doesn't do very much with them. And he takes some lousy ones or lousy Bible studies and does amazing things because he is God. He is the one who gives life to his word. This is why we pray. This is why we ask God to bless it. Now, sometimes you can feel it, you think. Preachers call it the unction of the Holy Spirit. But then other times, things seem kind of dull. And you're like, oh, man, that wasn't a very good Bible study. But then you see how God uses it in people's lives. That's what established the church in Thessalonica. It was not Paul's excellence or his giftedness, but literally God himself in the Holy Spirit. And look, it's, it's not just in Paul. Uh, verse 6, he says that the, it came in the Holy Spirit, but then go down to verse 6. You all, the Thessalonians, received it in the midst of trouble. You received it with the joy of the Holy Spirit. You see, so it's, hopefully the Holy Spirit is, is working through the speaker, the Bible study leader, but then the Holy Spirit has to also work in the hearers. This is, look, when we evangelize, this is why we don't force people um, to make a decision. This is why we don't try to argue them in. We pray for them. We, we want the Holy Spirit to change their minds. We don't want them just to sign a quick decision card. And we, I mean, God can use those too, but but the point is, if it's really a, a, someone coming to Christ, it's because the Holy Spirit has drawn them, and you can be patient then, knowing that if God has called them, which we, 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 we trust and believe he is as we, we pray for them, then he will, will bring them in time. As Paul says when he's on trial and he's accused of being crazy, he says, I'm not crazy. He says, uh, and, 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 and Agrippa says, are you going to make me become a Christian? And Paul says, whether short or long, I pray that everyone in this room becomes as I am except without these chains, whether short or long. And so, Rob, as you meet with your friend, I don't know what, pre- what scriptures you're, you're picking. I assume not in the middle of Leviticus or something, but I don't know. God can use that. But you're praying that the, that the Holy Spirit will give those words life. It's not your logic. You're praying that the Holy Spirit is working in this man's co-worker's heart to draw him. This is what we do. You don't have to be good. Just open the Bible and pray. That's why any of us can share Christ with friends. You don't have to be an expert. Just meet with somebody. Read a psalm. Read a little bit of the Gospel of John. Pray for them. Let them see your sincerity. Don't let them feel a worldly pressure. Don't don't make it about joining your group. It's about them and their souls. And so they receive the Holy Spirit with joy. This is why we pray. I love the hymn we sometimes sing. I thought about it this morning, but I really don't think it would have worked with horns. Uh, Brethren, we have met to worship and adore the Lord our God. Will you pray with all your power while we try, I love this, while we try to preach the word? All is vain unless the spirit of the Holy One comes down. Brethren, pray and holy manna will be showered all around. There's a third way as we wrap up. Third way, the word came to Thessalonica, and it came with power and in the Holy Spirit, but also with full conviction. Now, what does that mean? Is it that Paul had a conviction as he spoke, or was it that the Thessalonians felt a conviction about their sins? And it's probably both. They they could see that Paul was a man who knew he was a sinner. Paul was a murderer, a blasphemer, he says. But he was also a man who met the risen Christ and knew he was forgiven. And so then they felt the same conviction themselves. The Holy Spirit showed them their own sins and then gave them joy as they too met the risen Christ in his word. And they too are convinced, verse 10, that Jesus delivers them from the wrath to come, that they deserve wrath, but they won't face it because Jesus delivers it from them. And so, of course, that brought them joy. And so that's what, that's what exactly, so they, they, they saw that Paul believed that he, he was a sinner saved by grace. They are sinners saved by grace. And then Paul goes on, and the result we'll look at next week, that others then saw their example. They're imitating Paul and his faith, and not just Paul, but his friends. They, they see sinners, 
but who also have Christ, then they themselves have Christ, and then the word spreads. This is how revival happens. When the Holy, it's, a, it's, it's not a, a, a church growth movement. It's, it's not a, a 501c organization. It's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. I don't know if you've read the news, but there's a, there's a revival starting to break out in Asbury College in Kentucky. Yay! It's not a Pentecostal school where these things happen more regularly. It's a Methodist school. And I don't know exactly what's happening, and I don't know how it will last, and I'm, you know, I'm Presbyterian, so I generally don't trust emotions. Or, and, and, and I really don't like meetings, so I don't you know, really like events. But apparently this was spontaneous, and it started Wednesday in chapel, and they, they, the students just didn't want to go to class, so they just are continuing to pray and pray. And whatever you think about it, it's students confessing their sin, it's students praying together, it's students praising Jesus' name. That's always a good thing. And so we should pray that as it is sincere in a work of the Spirit, it spreads throughout Kentucky and then throughout the United States as people are first broken but then they turn to God's objective work done in Jesus Christ. That's what we want to see. That's what happened across Macedonia and Achaia. That's what we want to see in our land. That's why these three sets of three are so important. We need faith, hope, and love. Where do we get those? Well, it's God's love for us. It's his choosing us in Christ, his work. And it's the proclamation of the gospel that comes with power. It comes by the work of the Holy Spirit. So it's a spiritual thing out of our control. And it comes with conviction that this is the best news in the world. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And so shall God's word that comes out from his mouth that shall not return to him empty, but shall accomplish that which he purposes. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we would... Go out in joy and be led forth in peace. Forgive us our sins. Help our own faith and hope and love to grow. Dependent not on our works, but on your work. We need you, Jesus, and we have you. Help us to believe it. And we pray in your name. Amen. I can think of no better way to reflect this text than the great hymn, And Can It Be. This is the very first hymn I ever memorized. A wonderful, rich hymn as we sing all five verses and really as we sing that last and fifth verse. Sing it with faith and joy. Let's stand together.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.